exploitation. So we're talking about now the what it takes to go from having done some information gathering and knowing about what software is running on that computer to actually running an exploit and taking control or you know exploiting a software vulnerability that's on that computer. So it's actually probably the easiest step because if you've done your information gathering, you've done the hard work. At this point, you, just, you know, often if you're using a, an existing exploit someone else has written, basically pointing it at the computer and firing, firing it, basically. Um, so that's what that's what we're going to talk about. So once an attacker has gathered all the information about a target, they can start to think about what kinds of attacks are likely to work. There's no point firing off a bunch of you know Windows exploits against a Linux system. None of them are going to work and you're going to waste all your time and you know you you're much better off figuring out okay what is this so software I'm attacking and looking at how am I actually going to ha successfully attack that system there's a few ways you can go about doing that there's your own personal knowledge so for example if you see an old windows xp windows 2000 server you know there's going to be loads of vulnerabilities there and if you've been working in in the area in the field you'll know there's a whole bunch that they're going to be vulnerable to. You might not need to look up anything, you can just start fire up the exploit straight away. Um, but there are so many like software vulnerabilities out there that you're not going to know all of them. So there are a few ways you could you know, check. Uh, so you can use databases. So there are online databases where you can go to a website like Security Focus, look up the software, and I'll tell you about um, you know, what vulnerabilities are likely to exist in that software. There are local databases that you can have on your own computer, and there's also automated analysis tools you can use to basically fire it off at a server or service, and it will try and figure out what it is vulnerable to and suggest, you know, based on what I can see on this computer, it's likely to be vulnerable to these attacks. Um, so you can do things like using Metasploit's database and search. You can use vulnerability scanning and assessment so things like Nessus, and you can use automated attack tools. So for example, what's included in Armitage. So I'm gonna talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. So never underestimate the importance of actually knowing things. It's kind of like when people ask why we've got closed book tests. So you know, in real life, you can Google stuff if you don't know something. Well, that's true, but if you have to Google everything, you're not gonna be a very um, efficient worker. Right. If every problem that you ever come across, you need to like Google it. It's going to take you twice as long to do anything than someone that actually just knows stuff and they can just do it. So it is important to, to, to learn things. Um, but ob obviously, in this area, just staying up to date with news about the security events that have happened and um, just from experience of things you've attacked before can help you to know the sorts of attacks that are likely to work. Um, but also, if you know stuff, you can do problem solving based on context. So for example, you're told you're attacking a web server, but you don't see any of the standard ports open that usually a web server would be on. Because you're a human being, you can figure out what's going on, whereas if you're just an automated piece of software, you might completely miss the fact that there's something strange going on here. Um, you can use databases of exploits. So you're not going to know everything. So you can use... Um, databases and they often they will include the actual exploit itself, some a proof of concept, some actual attack code someone else has written that you can download. Sometimes people like to be a bit tricky and they'll include like a, a very simple programming mistake just to catch people that don't actually know what they're doing. So you, you might download an exploit and it'll be there'll be some error and it'll just be like one thing you need to fix in the code to make it work properly. That's actually, I think, happening less now. It used to be quite common um, back in the day that people would do that. But uh, usually most exploits just work. Um, but some examples of that is Security Focus. Um, so you go onto that website and they'll include some you know, actual exploit downloads and the exploit DB, which includes not only the exploit, um, but actually often the vulnerable software as well. So for your report, it's perfect because you can download some software which you can then attack. So security focus looks a bit like this and you can do the, um, the vulnerability search and you can search by vendor software title and things like that. So you can see here, 
you basically, you can just um, put who the vendor is, select the title of the software that you're trying to attack, and then, you know if you know what the version is, and then you click submit, and um, basically there'll be like a long list of all the vulnerabilities that um, are known or that this website includes in its database for that specific software. So just looking at an example of that is the RPC DCOM vulnerability. So this specific example is an a, um, actual vulnerability in the operating system itself. So someone working at Microsoft years ago now made a programming mistake which meant that any of those old versions of Windows, so if you've got any Windows, um, I think it was basically everything before, I think it was around the year 2000, it probably says it on there somewhere, 2003 is when the CVE was registered. Pretty much every version of Windows before that, and there's a long list here of um, versions of Windows, pretty much everything. So Windows XP, anything like Service Pack 1 and earlier. Um, there is Windows Server, so Windows 2003 and, and earlier. Windows NT. So all of these versions of Windows were all vulnerable to attack. Um, and it is a, was a buffer overflow in a public service. So that means you could basically connect to any Windows computer, fire off the exploit, which caused the buffer overflow, which um, basically is just you using memory in an unsafe way so that like, you overflow uh, the, the value in a variable and the overwrite stack and it causes bad things to happen. You basically take control of their, um, their computer. So because it overwrites the ins instruction pointer, so the EIP register. Um, but anyway, so, so it causes a buffer overflow and you get full control over that Windows machine. Um, so for this specific example, um, in Security Focus, you can click on the Exploit tab and there's like actual code you can download to attack a Windows computer. Um, there's loads of information under the, you know, under the discussion section. Um, there's some information about solutions, so newer versions of Windows will patch that problem, this specific problem, but if there's an old unpatched system, then you can you know, fire up the exploit. Um, and it also includes the CVE, so that's the thing I was looking at before to see what year the CVE was registered. And CVE is quite important. So CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exp uh, Exposures. It's basically like an online dictionary of all the publicly known security vulnerabilities that exist, basically, in, in the world that have been reported. So it's public, it's free to use. Um, the actual CVE list doesn't include any technical details or exploits or anything, but it gives this um, unique identifier, CVE identifier, which includes that number that we were just looking at. Um, because it makes it easier for all the different tools and when you're Googling for, to find information about this vulnerability, if you search for the CVE number, you can find all the information about it. Uh, so it's like a public ID for that software um, vulnerability. Because otherwise if you had all these different companies looking at the security of it and we don't have a standard way of referring to a specific vulnerability, then you know, we often we might be talking about two separate things, but we think we're talking about the same exploit, or the same vulnerability. Um, so this helps to um, clarify that. So the actual identifier is made up of a number. So for example, CVE 2003-0352, which is the RPC DCOM vulnerability we were just looking at. Um, it'll include a very short description and some references to other sources of information. So it'll, it might include some links that will get you somewhere where you'll actually find the exploit and more detailed information. Um, last year, the actual syntax, like the, the, what, the way that that's um, you know, defined, changed. So because before we were actually stuck to four digits and we're running out of numbers because, you know, there's more than um, you know, 9,999 vulnerabilities were you know, being discovered each year. So it needed to actually increase it so that we have um, like a larger number. So now you, you can basically put a longer number there. So you know, that's a big deal because obviously there's loads of vulnerabilities that are discovered all the time. And even if you're just tracking the news, that basically every week there are new vulnerabilities that, that are discovered 
and a lot of them don't make it to the news. You know, there's just loads of vulnerabilities all the time. Um, so CB is actually managed by MITRE, um, which is funded by the US Department of Homeland Security. Um, if you need a CB number, so say for example you find a new vulnerability, you can actually register one. So you've asked for one <coughs> from a CB numbering authority. Uh, and there are some that will publicly make an announcement about it, but you can also request, if you contact MITRE directly, you can ask them not to publish information because you have, you're not ready for it to go public. Uh, and that comes back to the responsible disclosure thing. Um, so a lot of them will include a link to code for an exploit, and it can be written in any programming language at all. Often it's in C uh, as a standalone exploit. Um, so basically it can be written in any language because all an exploit often does is it connects over a network and it sends some information over. Right? So you could do that in any language. But traditionally they were written in C and nowadays Metasploit is so popular they're often Metasploit modules um, which are written in Ruby. So if you do have a C um, file that you need to use, basically just like any other C program, you download the C file, often there's just like one single C file. You check it's compatible with your operating system, which you can do by looking at the headers that it uses. So if it's like Windows headers, then it's not gonna work on a Linux system, but as the attack computer uh, and vice versa. You compile it and then you run it, right? Um, so compiling it is where it takes the C code and creates the actual executable file. You then run that and t give it the information it needs to know in order to attack the right computer. So, um, Obviously, you might not trust the exploit code, so you probably don't want to be like running these exploits on your own like home computer. If you use a virtual machine, if you you know, or do it in the labs, obviously, just in case there's some um, malicious software in the exploit that you're running. So this is an example of some of um, some C code for a standalone exploit, uh, and in this case, there's a lot of hard coded information. So this, you know, is basically. The, um, the attack is going to send this information to the vulnerable computer uh, and obviously this is a lot of hex so the slash x something or other for like hex values so this is what it basically going to what it's going to send uh, and you can see here this is the actual bind shell if you remember uh, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about um, actual payloads so um, in this case, this is the payload that it's actually sending. And see all these slash 90s? There are no ops, so it literally does nothing. So it's like, you know, it's a not slide, not slide. And then at the end of that, this is the actual um, code that causes uh, it to connect, uh, basically start listening on port 4444 um, as a bind shell, so then the attacker can connect to that to get access to the computer. Um, but yeah, so standalone code can be quite um, obscure. Um, but when you run it, you end up with remote shell on that computer. If you look on the exploit DB, this is what the website looks like. There's a whole list of um, exploits. Probably if you, for your report, for example, you might be interested in a remote exploit, which is an exploit that goes over the network to attack another computer, as opposed to a local exploit where you need to have some access to that computer already. Uh, and if you look here, so that list there, that icon there that my um, cursor is over at the moment, that is uh, like a link to download that vulnerable software. And those links across here are the actual, um, if you click on these links here, you can get to the actual exploit itself. There's also an offline version of it on Kali Linux where you, from the command prompt, you can search for uh, an offline version of this database, search through it rather than having to use the website. Uh, exploit frameworks. Um, can be used to um, for by pen testers and it makes things easier because basically instead of having loads of independent exploits that you need to fire off, it has like a database built into the program which you can fire off. Uh, they can be quite expensive, so you can see there's like Core Impact which costs something like 30 grand a year. Um, and then there's like Canvas and Metasploit is free. There's a professional version of it um, that costs something like $15,000 uh, a year, but there's a um, open source like underlying framework that is that's free to use and that's what we're using in this module. We do have a um, an educational license if you're interested in, in you know looking at the professional interface to it. Um, 
So basically the, there are exploit modules. So Metasploit is very important because um, it just makes things a lot easier. So in 2005, HD Moore, um, SpoonM created a talk called Metasploit Hacking Like in the Movies and it impressed people a lot because in that talk they demonstrated how they can basically fire off these attacks and re, you know, reuse that infrastructure. Um, it really eases exploit development because you can combine exploits with payloads and things rather than having all hard coded like we were just looking at where you've got this is the payload that gets sent with this thing and in order to send a different payload you need to change the source code. For Metasploit you say oh, I use this exploit and I want a bind shell or I want a reverse shell and it can do all that for you. Um, and you can search in Metasploit uh, for uh, an exploit that you're looking for. So you can do that online or locally with the command, um, in a command prompt or from the console. There's over a thousand different exploits that Metasploit includes. And you can do things like import results from Nmap scans. Um, and you can, um, it also includes its own scanners, but to be honest, uh, Nmap is better. Uh, Nmap is an incredible, incredibly powerful scanner. Um, but Metasploit does include its own scanners, like the one that listed up on the screen there. Uh, but yeah, you can do things like search for specific exploits. Um, you can search by CV numbers or platforms and things like that to find the Metasploit module you're after. Um, Armitage is a front end to Metasploit, which is um, developed by separate people. So it's a third party front end, gives a graphical interface to the Metasploit framework. It exposes the Metasploit framework features um, and it's quite visual and it, it'll do things like recommend exploits that you might want to use and things like that. And you, it also has a feature where it just launched loads of attacks. It's usually not what you want. A Hail Mary attack, it literally just will just fire off like hundreds of you know exploits. It'll just try loads of stuff to try and break into a computer. It's not usually what you want to do because obviously your log files, you're just lighting it up like a Christmas tree. Like it's not. If you're an actual attacker, it's probably not what you want. But you know, maybe it'll be helpful for you in the labs to just try a few different things out to see what's going to work. Um, this is what Armitage looks like. So it's laid out like that, where you've got a list of modules on the top left-hand side, and you've got targets. So you, each time it detects a um, computer, it'll show you the icon representing the computer and what operating system it's detected on it, and uh, you know you can do clever things. But the, one of the best things is at the bottom it actually shows you the Metasploit commands that it's using to do the attack. So you can do things like find attacks and check exploits and Hail Mary where it just tries everything out. Vulnerability analysis is where you basically use an automated scanner to try and find vulnerabilities. So it'll basically do a port scan, do service identification and say based on that information these are the exploits that are likely to work against that system. And vulnerability scanners don't usually do attacks for you, but it will point out the stuff that might work. It's automated and quite shallow. It might miss things, but also it can have a lot of false positives because it sees like this service looks like it's vulnerable when it might not be. Um, so often when you're doing a security test, you'll start with doing an automated scan using something like Nessus, and then you test whether or not it's actually correct by using like Metasploit to actually see whether you can confirm that it really is vulnerable. Uh, so that's known as vulnerability analysis or assessment or scanning, depending on who you talk to. So the, these tools, they basically start by doing port scans and they um, basically compare that information to a database. They can be quite expensive, but if you are doing a, if you're a security tester, like if you're doing a pen test, it is a good idea to invest in software like this. So Nessus is probably the most popular um, and it's relatively cheap, you know, in you know, related to some of the other options. Um, it's got its own attack scripting language. Um, lots of different things it can do. And there's a couple of other alternatives there as well. Um, so I recommend that you have a look through that to make sure that you're aware of it in case it comes up in the test. But we're out of time. So in conclusion, once an attacker knows details of a system, um, that's often all they need in order to start actually launch an attack. So they can take that information they've gathered from that information, compare it to information from databases of exploits that exist, find one that's likely to work, and then you can try it out and actually try launching against the system and see what happens. There is a risk, some risk that if you try attacking a computer, it might cause it to crash, obviously, because you're doing things that is not supposed to happen on that computer. 
So just be aware of that. Uh, and only attack computers that you have permission to attack. Um, vulnerability scanners can be less risky, they're less likely to go down, cause damage, but also they're more likely to have false uh, positives, so they'll say something's wrong when it's not. That's all I've got to say, and we're out of time, so I'll see you next week, and good luck starting getting started on your report.